Welcome to Arise Life, a community of believers being equipped, empowered, and released into their destiny. For more information, go to ariselife.org or follow us on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram. Anybody? It ain't. It is a violent act of exactly what we were praying into today. Of coming back to the place of your greatest loss and letting God rewrite your history. Anybody want that? Okay, David gets it. You don't. None of y'all. Okay, I'll leave it to you. Okay, there's three of us. Okay. The rest of you, you got to act fast. This is like dial now. You know, the operators are standing by. Listen, listen. The kingdom belongs to the hungry. Listen, listen, when the bar, when the, when the buffet is open, the first one there gets it all, especially if you followed my brother and I through a church buffet. Listen, you were out of luck. If you came after us, all you saw was empty plates. Listen, rise up, kill and eat, get what's yours. All right, okay. So one of the things I need you to do is stay in that place that Masha was talking about, that deeply uncomfortable place of despair of lost dreams, of betrayal, of self, of failure of self, right? Because that, everything we're going to talk about speaks to that today. That's the canvas. And he's going to speak a better word. So if you were here last week, we're still going to recap. So here's the deal. You guys remember the story starts out, we, in verse 1, we have this introduction of there, it says, in the days that the judges ruled. What kind of day was that? It was the day when everybody did what was right in their own eyes. Do you know, if there is a group of 30 and everybody does what's right in their own eyes, actually only one person gets to, ha- to decide what's going on. The biggest, baddest, and meanest, right? Right? Everybody else is sit down. <laughs> they don't get to do what's right in their own eyes, do they? They just kind of have to take it. But it was a horrible time. It was a terrifying time. It was a time of brutality. It was a time when the, the powerful and the meanest and the wickedest took over. And uh, mm, it wasn't a good time. And said there was a famine in the land. It's interesting. Um, we, were, we were with our young adults um, on Tuesday, and we were talking about fear. And, and one of the ladies asked me, but what if my fear is rational? Right? God says, do not fear. But what if my fear is rational? Who here, you only have rational fears? Yeah, mine are all legitimate, right? Yeah, I mean, don't come and look at mine because when you look at them, they look stupid, but mine are rational. I have good reason to do this. I'm not stupid, right? I have thought this out, right? Okay, all right. Even the weird, anybody here have some seriously ones? If anybody knew you had this fear, they'd be like, you know, fit you for a straitjacket, but you know... There's a chance. You know what the old story, right? You know, you know uh, what is it? It's like the, the chances of dying from sheep is, is never completely zero. <laughs> like, right? There's never, in every situation, there's always a chance, right? And the issue is, we remember this, Naomi, so we got this. It said that there was a famine in the land. So a man from Bethlehem, that's the land, what, what kind of land? It's the house of bread, Right? Imagine what kind of a, what a place you're from where they're, they're like bread, bread, best bread in town, best bread. They got bread coming out their ears. He said, in Judah, the place of praise, together with his wife and two sons, because of the famine, went to live in the country of Moab, the place where for the sake of survival, you will do the unthinkable. Who here? Don't raise a hand on this one. Who here? You've done things you never thought you'd do because of fear and the need to survive. All of us, so many of us. The, the lie is, at least I'll be alive. You know, and the reality, what I said about a rational fear, so there were, there were three major hubs of civilization in the ancient world, all on sides of Israel. To the east was Mesopotamia, Sumeria, Assyrians, Babylonians. To the southwest was Egypt, and to the north was the Hittite kingdom, one of the most enduring, most powerful kingdoms so powerful, in fact, that the greatest battle in the ancient world, the Battle of Kadesh, was between the Hittite kingdom and the Egyptians in 1274. They're in the area of, of Kadesh in the middle of uh, north of Israel. And it was the most massive 
chariot battle in history. And the Hittites were so powerful, they fought one of the greatest pharaohs, Ramesses II, to a standstill and almost captured him. They were so powerful. But as great as they were, less than 70 years later, their entire empire was wiped out by a famine. The famine, that almost certainly was the famine Ruth faced. It was that severe that in the space of three years, the entire empire got wiped off the face of the earth. So you're saying it's a problem, right? Right? It's a problem. It's a legitimate, they are facing a legitimate catastrophic problem. And who are my people? When you face problems, you come up with solutions. Who are my solution people? It's okay, Jesus. I got this one. Who here, you can only wait so long, and then you're like, all right, somebody got to move. Thank you, Lord. Ta I tagged myself in. <laughs> His name, though, the man who left the land of promise to go to the one place they weren't supposed to go, Moab, was, his name was Elimelech, my God is king. Is his God king if he goes where God says not to go? We all like to give lip service that, I, Lord, I will follow where you lead me. He is not your king if you don't do what he says. If you live in a democracy, Lord, thank you, we will take that under advisement. Me, myself, and I, and nope, we're against it. Thank you, Lord. <laughs> That's not a kingdom. That's delusion. That is the land of denial in Egypt. His name was Elimelech and his wife was Naomi, my desire. And we talked about this. We are so often led astray by our own desires, are we not? Who here, you're pretty sure you know what you want? I have, who here has been surprised when God brought you something that you didn't think you wanted and it turned out to be exactly what you want? Do you think your designer, your creator might just know what kind of fuel you run on? And the names of his two sons were sickly and languishing unto death. <laughs> wow. And they, they were Ephrathites. And this is what Marshall was talking about. The land of the ash heap, which is actually the place of fruitfulness. See, when you put your ashes of your dreams, the ashes of your failures, the ashes of your despair and your, your frustration and your betrayal into the ground, he can bring out a harvest of fruitfulness. But when we hold on to them, hmm. they were Ephrathites from Bethlehem in Judah, right? And they went to Moab and lived there in case you missed it the first time. When the Bible repeats itself, it's trying to say, pay attention. And what happened when they went there? They died. They died. Naomi's hope, her husband and her two sons died. And you know what they did there? They did the one thing they really weren't supposed to do is they married Moabite women. <laughs> it was like, God's like, okay, don't do that. Okay, don't do that. Don't do that. Okay, really don't do that. Because in the Bible, in the past, Moabite women were the downfall of the Israelites. So who here has died by inches? Do you know what I'm talking about? Where you just made a little compromise, a little compromise. I mean, it's, it's a good purpose. I mean, we're saving our lives, right? You know, I have to do this. I have to do this. By inches, and you end up in a place you never wanted to be. In a place where you can't even remember what it was like to hear God. What it was like to know his love, know his provision, know his family. And then her despair. She does what we talked about in Gideon. She goes, all right, I better go home. I better go home. I have nothing here. Do you guys remember? Jesus told a story about a father with two sons. Where he got to the point where literally there was nothing left for him. He was eating the pig slop. And he said, well, it's better in my father's house even for the slaves. Might as well go home. Do you think Naomi had a, a glowing picture of what waited her when she went home? Okay, you've never done this. But who here has um, blazed out of something, some place, 
some set of relationships, and either with a bold declaration of, see ya, I'm going to be amazing, or, <laughs> and it, and it, you either shot the people or you told them, I'm going to be amazing, good luck. Nobody? You've never blazed out? Wow. Wow. David, you're going to keep me afloat. David's the only honest one here. All right. Okay. You're going to wish you knew me when. <laughs> and who here found it was not all it was promised? Now, suddenly, you long for the good old days. Now, here's my question. If you're longing for the good old days, what would keep you from going back? Pride. Okay, what, talk, talk me through that. How would pride keep me from going back? Admit I was wrong. Okay, what else? Shame. Shame. What am I ashamed of? That I was wrong. What else? Disobeying. What's that? Uh huh. Uh, failure. Failure. What they will? What? Okay, let me ask you a question. This is this is this is this is where it's getting hot and heavy. Uh, what you said, Dan, what will, okay, so let me ask you a question. I'm not asking what they will think of you. I'm asking what you think they'll think of you. Come on. What do you think? Give me, give me some adjectives. Loser. Loser. What else? Come on. Huh? You suck. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Sucker. What else? Idiot. Idiot. Drunk. Yeah, uh huh, uh huh. Hip. What did you say? Bless his heart. Whoa. Watch your language there. This is the church. Uh, yes, uh, was, I heard something. What was that? Hypocrite, drunk, hypocrite. There was one other. Pity. Ooh. What was this one over here? Rebellious. Rebellious. Okay. So who here is fairly confident they're going to hold a meeting to discuss in full detail how pathetic you are? <laughs> like, at least in your mind, you're like, the only thing anybody's going to want to talk about for the next three years is how bad. They're going to stop everything. They're going to stop everything so we can discuss how horrible you are. I got really good news for you. You're not that special. <laughs> People care less than you think. Why? Because they're obsessed with their own navel. Okay? I, I mean, seriously. I'm like, I mean, who here? Yeah, I love the devil can sell you two diametrically opposed lies at the same time. I'll go back and nobody will even notice me. And all they'll do is talk about me for weeks. And I'll believe them both. Like, you can't have both. Either they're obsessed with you or they don't know you exist. It's both. It's both. I don't know how, but it's both. Oh, listen, listen, listen. How badly was Naomi hurting that she was willing to come back to? Is that Naomi? The years have not been kind to you, honey child. Have you considered Mary Kay? I got a dealer. One of the most tormenting places is that place where we voluntarily enter the courtroom of the accuser and let him abuse us, using the ghosts of other people to do it. You ain't that special, but you are to God. But how much was she willing to overcome? And do you remember... You know, it says that she came back. She came back in verse 19 of chapter 1. They make their way back. And she, it says the two women went on until they came to Jerusalem. By the way, this was 130 miles through the desert. They had to leave a little bit of water, a little bit of green, go through massive desert into the deep, right down to the edge of the Dead Sea. If you're going to come back, 
to the land of promise, you're going to have to pass the Dead Sea. So let me ask you, let me, let, let, let's, just, let's just slaughter Naomi for a minute because it's not us, right? What do you think had to die in Naomi? What died in her on the way back to the land of promise? Hope? Pride? Fear? Self-worth? Dignity. <laughs> Sorry, inside Russian joke. Moving on. She didn't care what, what it took. Uh, I'll say th this way. It, she, she laid down her control, her limits. Yeah. Because all of her hope... So, the hope was hope in a specific outcome, wasn't it? Hope in God is good if X. Who are my people? You look at a situation, God's goodness here will be X. If God loves me, Y. Right? Hope is it's not hoping God, it's hoping a thing. Hoping an outcome. She had to die because all of her hopes died. Do you know in the ancient world there was nobody lower than a widow? who could not bear children. She had no rights. She had no privilege. She had no income. She had no source of income. She had no means of self-defense. In a land that's ruled by the mafia, you imagine being a woman all by yourself? She's in a bad place. Her fear, she had to face fear head on because to go from the little, who are my people? You get into a place where you're like, I want to go back, but I barely have anything as it is. And it will cost me everything to go back. She had to leave the little bit of safety and security, go through the desert, go past the Dead Sea, and then climb back on the other side. 130 miles, but 3,000 feet elevation change. Man, it's like four times taller than Kennesaw Mountain. And through the desert. And she had to face, I love this, self-worth. Do you know how you know it's self-worth that's dying? <laughs> what does self-worth dying feel like? It's where what I trusted in for my worth can die. Do you know that anything that is external to me can die? But who he says I am cannot be touched. If my worth is in my success, in my clothes, in my husband, my wife, my kids, my car, my stuff, my position, my job, whatever your opinion of me, it will die. And she had to face all of that. Her dignity, she went out with her tail between her legs, leaving. Listen, you know how bad you have to be to leave the land where you'll do anything just to survive? <laughs> wow, you're the reject from Moab. That's pathetic. That's like impressive. Yeah, anybody been in that place where you're like, how low can you go? It's like limbo, right? No, but then she's going out and she goes, that. But who goes with her? It's not gazelle. It's not the good looking one. It's friendship. You know what? There are people in your life God has given you and you despise them because you don't think they're worthy of you. But they're the ones he sent to you to reveal his goodness to you. And they're actually doing better than you, but you've despised them. Mm, sorry. Whoa. It's about to get ugly. Um, they, hmm. God will regularly put what you need in the mouth of the person you value the least. Yeah. Stay with me. So her name is, she's friendship. But she is willing to leave the place where she has anything to go with Naomi because she says, your God will be my God. Naomi has given up on God. But Ruth still sees the vestiges, the remains of the good life, the goodness that Naomi has experienced in the past. So they get back and she goes, don't call me. And when they come back, can this be Naomi? Surely. She was so much better looking. 
Don't call me Naomi. Call me Mara because the Almighty has made my life very bitter. Actually, that's a really nice way to put it. Let me say another way. Do you know what that verse really says? Because God has been, has afflicted me or has been evil to me. Okay, who are my people? You have a narrative in your head. You don't bring it out very much because you feel convicted. But you really think God's done you wrong. Okay, moving on. I went away full, but the Lord has brought me back empty. Why call me Naomi? The Lord has afflicted me. The Lord has, the Almighty has brought misfortune on me. Who went to the land of Moab? Did God go there? Who said don't go to the land of Moab? But isn't it good that God doesn't deal with us according to what we deserve? But that verse that Masha said, Hosea chapter 2, he will allure us to the wilderness and there give us back our hope. Give us back our lives. Give us back. And he said, and there, there we'll come to her. So it says, so Naomi returned from Moab, uh, Moab accompanied by Ruth the Moabite. Stay with that. Why is Ruth called the Moabites or my Moabite? That's where she's from. Who here is trying to escape where you're from? Am I getting just too much in your business? I'm, I'm just saying, who here is trying to escape your past? Who here has a part of your story you don't want people to know about? Is that better? Three of us. Okay, this is a blink twice. Okay, good, good. Thank you, thank you. Okay, all right. <laughs> I was like, whoo, okay, stay with me. I'm going to get, tell you ahead of time. Do you know what? We know who Ruth is, right? We know who Ruth, where Ruth is from. Do you know what they keep calling Ruth throughout this? Ruth the Moabites. Who here would get a little frustrated? Hey, Ruth, from the land where people do unspeakable things just to survive. Hey, Ruth, you little. I'm going to tell you a secret. God won't let you escape your past because your past is the canvas on which he reveals his glory. I'll give you an example. Now, if I say, Robin, I see you. People are like, wow, that was a magic trick? What was that? You see me. Wow. Woo. But then if I say, five seconds ago, I was blind. Now I see you. Oh, now we're talking about something. Do you know it's our lack, our patheticness, our loserdom? It is the where we have nothing, where we failed. That's what reveals his glory. Not you performing at an Olympic level of awesomeness. Who here, you fantasize about, you fantasize about being Naomi. I'm just coming back to Bethlehem. Just I'll saunter in. I got the money. I got the stuff. See, I made the right choice. No, it, who, who here has spent a lot of time and effort trying to hide your past? When God wants to use your past to reveal his glory. See, if you're, if you're still hiding your past, then you think your past still defines you. Not him. Well, I'm afraid of people judging you. They're going to judge you. They're going to judge you. Nothing you can do about it. If you're trying to keep people from judging you, you're out of luck. Ask me how I know, because I've tried. I've tried. Well, maybe if I just do it the right thing. Maybe if I do what they like. Maybe if I... Blah, 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 blah. No. 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 They're still going to judge you. But when I say, God, my failure is the canvas of your glory. My lack reveals your glory. In my weakness, your strength is perfected. It's so severe that Paul has to say, whoa, 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 whoa. Because every time I sin, God's glory shows up. I need to tell you, don't try to sin so God's glory shows up. Like, it's that, it's that serious. He's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. But seriously, it is our weakness that reveals his glory. So Naomi comes walking back in with Ruth, the Moabitess, Right? Then nobody will let her forget that she's a Moabitess. Moabite, bite, bite, Mo, no, Moabiter? I don't know. Anyway, Moabiter. 
Um, a little butter blues. Anyway. And her daughter, arriving in Bethlehem as the har- barley harvest was beginning. So the beginning of March. This is also a horrible time to travel. It's cold and wet and nasty. Now Naomi, verse 1, had, had a relative on her husband's side, a man of standing from the clan of Elimelech, whose name was Boaz. Now, two things. We would have snuck Boaz in at the last minute and been like, surprise, stunning. That's not how they did that. They would always be like, hey, 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 watch out. We got this Boaz dude coming in. But also, this is the last name we get introduced to. Boaz. Remember what her husband's name was? God is king, but he wasn't really. Remember what her son's name was? Sickly and languishing unto death. You know what Boaz means? He is my strength. Whoa. Do you think Naomi, do you think she had any hope of her story turning out well? I mean, just being real. What do you think she thought her best case scenario was coming back? Survival. 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 Remember how she got into Moab in the first story? For the sake of survival, you'll do. God will even use our brokenness to draw us to him. (laughs) She went to Moab out of survival, but she came back for survival. She says, but it says, but look, we have Boaz. And I said, it said a man of standing. I was like, what does that mean? Does he go outstanding in his field? I don't know. What does that mean? And so I, I looked it up. Do you know what this word is? Do you guys remember Gideon? When, when the angel walked up and said, man of valor. Boaz was a man of valor. He was a man who was walking in his identity, walking in his destiny. He was a man. And it said, and, he was, and they related to him. And Ruth the Moabite, see what I'm saying? Said to Naomi, let me go to the fields and pick up leftover grain behind anyone in whose eyes I find favor. So you got to understand, they come into the, into the area. Her husband sold off their land before they left. They have no land. They have no stuff. They're probably just living out under, a, under a, a, like a shack, like a shelter, a lean-to in the fields. Nothing. Have you ever been in the spot where you're like, I don't have any options? There, I'm done. I don't have any options. I got here. I don't know what to do. Do you notice Naomi doesn't have options? Naomi's from here. She knows how the system works. She doesn't have options. She's just sitting there going, what? But Ruth the Moabites, she says, hey, listen, let me go to the fields and pick up the leftover grain behind anyone in whose eyes I find favor. Now, the interesting thing is they had a rule that they weren't supposed to go around the edges of the field where it was sparse. They were supposed to leave that for beggars and widows and orphans. But you know what? In a time when everybody does what's right in their own eyes. But so she said, listen, I'm just going to go in and pick up the leftovers that they dropped. That seems like a lot of hard work for not a lot of guaranteed income. you know what? Ruth is brave. She's courageous. She's going, but here it is. She's also going out as a single woman of not her culture. Let me put it this way. It would be equivalent to a black young girl going into a white town in the Jim Crow South. No protection. And any man who took advantage of her not, she's not even human. And yet she's like, I'm doing this. I'm going to be brave. Naomi said, go ahead, my daughter. Notice Naomi doesn't go with her. She, yeah, Masha, Masha thinks it's because she's bitter. Why else do you think she didn't go? She's old. She's exhausted. Fearful. 
think she probably just didn't want to see people's faces. Ashamed. Right? It's really important that you hang out with courageous people who don't have your hang-ups. We like to hang out with people who have our hang-ups, don't we? Because then I don't feel convicted. But you need to hang out with people who ain't got your hang-ups. Just saying. Go ahead. So she went out and entered a field and began to glean behind the harvesters. As it turned out, she was working in a field belonging to Boaz, who was from the clan of Elimelech. We kind of got that. Just when Boaz arrived from Bethlehem and greeted the harvesters, then the Lord, he said, the Lord be with you. The Lord bless you. Now, the interesting thing is, if you've got Bibles, you may see that Lord is all caps. See, what we're learning about Boaz is Boaz is not a Sunday Christian, (laughs) Sunday Jew or Saturday Jew. He's because he doesn't say L or Baal. Those are the names like lowered, lowercase or El God be with you. He said Yahweh, the personal name of God. So we're like, oh, listen up, listen up, listen up. Something's going on with Boaz. He says, Lord, and the Lord bless you, they replied. And Boaz asked the overseer of his harvest, who does that young woman belong to? Now, who's offended already? I'm just saying, I'm just saying. But he says, who is that? Who is that young lady? Now, I've got a question. Why do you think he noticed her? She looked different? She's by herself? She didn't belong? All right, ladies, that's enough. Men, why did he notice her? I'm just, you ain't from around here. Can I buy you a drink? Ladies, you are so wonderful. <laughs> and the overseer said, she is who? The Moabite. She's got an overbite. Right? No, I mean, what is going on? Like, ah. Uh, Listen, if you want to escape your past, you're going to have to create a false identity. Because God uses all of you. And your past doesn't define you. It's the launch pad for his glory. She's the Moabitess who came back from Moab with Naomi. She said, please let me glean, gather among the sheaves behind the harvesters. Notice She's brave. She goes and asks permission. She doesn't sneak around in the dark afterwards. She said, and she came into the field and has remained here from morning till now. This is probably evening, except for a short rest in the heat of the day. Short rest. She is working like a dog. She's working hard. Who here are my people? You were waiting for the lottery to hit. This isn't about that. So Boaz said to Ruth, my daughter, uh, that's just, he wasn't, anyway, that's just how they talk. Listen to me. Don't go and glean in another field. Don't go away from here. That's why I said, hey, baby. Um, I mean, he was, (laughs) watch the field where the men are harvesting and follow along after the women. I have told the men. So the men would cut it. The women would gather it in sheaves, right? And what fell He said, I have told the men not to lay a hand on you. Come on. God has provision and protection for you, but you will never see it if you stay hiding. God has allies for you, but you'll never find them when you continue to hide. I have told the men not to, and whenever you're thirsty, go and get a drink from the water jars the men have filled. At this, she bowed down her face to the ground and she asked, why have I found such favor in your eyes that you notice me, a foreigner? Not in a notice, but you give favor to me. But Boaz said, listen on this. I have been told all about what you've done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband, how you left your father and mother and your homeland and came to live with a people you did not know before. Okay, here's the deal. If you don't control your story, then God can promote you in due season. God uses that she's a Moabitess to reveal how awesome he has been in her and through her. 
He will put on blast his deeds in you. May the Lord repay you for what you have done. May you be richly rewarded by the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to take refuge. And she said, may I continue to find favor in your eyes, my Lord. You have put me at ease by speaking kindly to your servant. Because in that world, he had full power over her life. And yet, he dealt in gentleness. That's why gentleness is a fruit of the Spirit. If you are strong, God empowers you to be gentle, not to be strong. If you are weak, he gives you strength. May I continue to find favor? All right. And uh, though I do not have the standing even of one of your servants. Remember remember the, the prodigal son? I'll just be a servant in your house. At mealtime, Boaz said to her, come over here. Have some bread and dip it in the wine vinegar. And then she sat down with the harvester and he offered her some roasted grain. That's just a little, you know, like a little appetizer. She ate all she wanted and had some left over. As he got up, as she got up to go back to gleaning, Boaz gave orders to his men, let her gather among the sheaves and don't reprimand her, even pull out some stalks for her from the bundles and leave them for her to pick up and don't rebuke her. So Ruth gleaned in the field until evening. So probably about a 12-hour day. Then she threshed the barley at night, right? So she's break, she, she beats it until the grains fall off and then she... She gathered up the grains, and she, and, and she threshed the barley she had gathered, and it amounted to about an ephah, 30 pounds. 30 pounds of grain. Do you know how much? Okay, if you are a really good farmer in Israel today, 30 pounds of grain comes from an eighth of an acre. But they weren't good farmers. This was acres, uh, this was acres of land that she had to gather. Sort. She was working like a dog. And God blessed her labor. So Ruth gleaned, ba 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 ba. She carried it back to town. And her mother in law saw how much she gathered. I think her mother in law about fell out. They're like, what? Do you, what do you think Naomi thought Ruth was going to come back with? Maybe a handful, maybe something. Maybe just get rejected everywhere, get run off everywhere. Maybe come back with bruises. When she saw this, Ruth also brought out and gave her what was left over after she had eaten enough. And then her mother-in-law asked her, where did you glean today? Because even that, she brought back the extra grain, the roasted grain to give to her mother, mother-in-law. She said, where did you glean today? She said, where did you work? Blessed be the man who took notice of you. But Ruth told her mother-in-law about the one at whose place she had been working. The name of the man I worked today was Boaz. Who are my plotters, schemers, I'm sorry, planners? <laughs> was this Ruth's plan? No. I promise you, you can't plan for how God wants to bless you. But you can plan your way out of his blessings. Then Ruth told her mother, he said, and the, the Lord bless him. And Naomi said to her daughter, like, he has not, God has not stopped showing his kindness to the living and the dead. Do you know what that word kindness is? I've mentioned it before. It's this word hesed. It's a word that doesn't exist in any other language. And they actually had to take in the Greek, take agape and twist it to make it mean hesed. Because hesed doesn't exist anywhere because it's a word that only God could create. It is where the one who has all the power, all the might, all the goodness stoops and serves the one who has nothing and gives all with no expectation of return. What did she say when she arrived in Bethlehem? God has been evil to me. Suddenly she says, he has not Stop showing his hesed to me, to the living and the dead. Because that man is a close relative. He's one of our guardian redeemers. Two side points. 
Who showed her the hesed, the love and kindness of the Lord? The, it, it came from Boaz, but it came through the Moabites. God will show you the kindness in the areas you are least proud of. God will show you his goodness in the areas that we are most likely to cover up. That's why Paul says, when you look at the body, he said, the parts that are most humble, we cover and get because they have a greater glory. God uses the very things that are weak to confound the wise. He uses the least things in our lives, not the best. She said that, and this is the other thing, is he's one of our guardian redeemers. Now stay with me. In the, in the Old Testament, there in, we have these concepts. Guardian redeemer and kinsman redeemer. Guardian redeemer meant in the, they, they were by law not allowed to sell their land in perpetuity for all time. Basically, you were supposed to sell your land for the number of years left till the year of Jubilee. Every 50 years, they were supposed to have a year of Jubilee and all the land went back to the people who originally had it. So you could never lose your inheritance. Sound familiar? The gifts and callings of God are without repentance. Right? You couldn't walk away from your inheritance. No matter how hard you tried, it was there. But remember, we're in what kind of time? The time when everybody does what's right in their own eyes. Do you know what they never celebrated? The year of Jubilee. Why not? What's in it for me? Ah, you walked away. Ah. So they sold their land in a time of famine when land was worthless. Right? So they walked away from their inheritance. Anybody walked away from an inheritance? Isn't it good to know that he, every single thing you and I drop, he holds for us if we're willing to go back. And he said, a guardian redeemer is somebody who was supposed to stand in the gap and if somebody like sold themselves into slavery, buy you back. They were supposed to guard your, your, you financially. She's like, oh, wow, he's one of our guardian redeemers. But again, this isn't a thing, <laughs> right? You understand what I mean? It's legally a thing, but it ain't a thing. Then Ruth, who? Ruth the... Uh, We might see more glory in our lives if we spent less time hiding the places he wants to reveal his glory. He even said, uh, uh, said to me, stay with my workers until they finished harvesting all the grain. So for this whole month, a whole month of work. So, you know, figure 30 days, you know, times 30, you know, that's, that's a lot of grain. That's almost a ton of grain. Wow. Wow. And Naomi said to her daughter-in-law, it will be good for you, my daughter, to go with the women who work for him because in someone else's field, you might be harmed. In other words, she thought about this when she sent her out. Aren't you glad that even God protects us from the people that are our allies? We don't have, he who attempts to save his life will lose it. So Ruth stayed close to the women of Boaz to glean until the barley and wheat Harvests were finished, and she lived with her mother-in-law. Who here, the minute you found out Boaz was a guardian redeemer, you started a plan? <laughs> Three of us? Do you think God needs our plans? His ways are higher than our ways. He has things, he has options. He has options. He has options, and we'll mess them up. A lot of times, why won't God show me the plans? He's like, because you try to do them in your own strength. Why won't God show me his plans? Because you'll run off and screw them up. I, my ways are better than yours. The final thing I want to say right now is we're going to be watching. Is We've watched Naomi's heart start to thaw. Do you know the number one reason we can't hear God? is because pain has caused us to turn off our hearts. The number one way God speaks is the still small voice. But when all the voices in our head are despair, regret, frustrations, 
When we think God has done us evilly, can we, can we hear from him? What I feel like God's doing today in the story of Naomi, as we walk by the Dead Sea, is he's saying, I have a future for you. I have a hope for you. In the places where you're most afraid, where you've most suffered loss, I have hope for you. But it's on my terms. Are you willing to lay it down at my feet? Lay down the past. Lay down the fear. Lay down the shame. Lay down what people might think of you. What, lay it down. Would you be willing to lay down all of the darkness that I might paint a new story in you? If we can have the worship team come up. I really believe God wants to speak a better word. But many of us, we have stopped our ears to stop from hearing the pain, the disappointment, the frustration, the betrayal. But I feel like right now God wants us, even as we've been doing today with those bones, to lay them down, to lay down the narrative. But what if people judge me? What if people lay down the control? If you do this, then you're good. If this happens, then you're good. Mm -mm. Laying it down, God, not my way, but yours. Not my will, but yours be done. If we can stand. Fathers, we come before you right now. We bring you our dead places, our places of fear and despair, our hopelessness, our betrayal, places we betrayed ourselves. Lord, we ask you right now, speak, speak, speak. We're listening. For more information, go to AriseLife.org or follow us on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram.